Welcome to the Port City Plate Podcast, presented by Bienville Bites Food Tour. The Port City Plate Podcast is a podcast serving up the food, history, and people of Mobile, Alabama for people who love the Port City. I'm your host, Chris Andrews, and today we are taking you to the corner of Fat and Happy in downtown Mobile with my friend Tony Sawyer from Bob's Downtown Restaurant. Uh, Tony started Bob's Downtown Restaurant 2014, uh, worked in the restaurant industry for many years, and Decided to open up his own diner, serving some of the best breakfast and lunch that you'll get in all of Mobile. And uh, so, Tony, thank you for joining the Port City Plate Podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, I'm excited about it. And uh, I guess, first of all, who the heck is Bob? Uh, Bob is uh, my Uncle Bobby. Uh, he was uh, my, my favorite uncle growing up and uh, my dad's youngest brother, so... Uh, when we, when he, he wanted to start a restaurant, okay, he had a, a, a hot dog cart in here, and uh, he wanted to start a restaurant. He knows nothing about the restaurant industry, so um, with my expertise, my father's expertise, we agreed to open up the restaurant with him, hence the name Bob's Downtown Restaurant. Well, um, through the years, you know, he decided that uh, it was best that he not... Uh, be around the, the business, couldn't handle it. Uh, so we just kept the name and uh, proceeded forward with that. I like it. So I, I know that your your website mentions that you have been a chef for over 25 years. Yes. So how did you get a job when you were 10? <laughs> well, yeah, you, you laugh at that, but I'm, I'm, I'm 50 years old. So uh, 25, uh, you know, my first job in a restaurant was Keeper's Restaurant in St. Augustine, Florida. I uh, had a motorcycle. I was just fresh out of high school, so I was probably 18 years old, and I worked there, and I worked at Albertsons doing the floors at night at Albertsons. So, um, and then I also worked for Pizza Hut Delivery, so I delivered pizzas here and there. Um, I figured that, you know, when I was working at Pizza Hut, I enjoyed it. You know, I enjoyed making pizzas. Hey, man, I, you know, at that age, I didn't have much money, and I wanted to eat. You know, I love to eat pizzas, so who doesn't, right? <laughs> Um, so that's where it really started. And then, you know, mother worked, uh, you know, she was a, a single mom raising three kids. And between her two and or three jobs at times, I would make her dinner. So that's really where it started at, you know, at, at a young age making her dinner. So when she would come home, she would be able to eat, get changed, and go to the next job, you know. Um, and that was just a little way to help her get through her day. You know, and make sure that she had a good hot meal when she got home from work. Mm-hmm. And your dad, he he was he's on the uh, uh, King Neptunes in Gulf Shores, is that right? Yes, he uh, he started that. Uh, him and uh, his wife Diane started that uh, 25, 26, 7, 8 years ago, something like that. And I was I was down there. I, okay, so just back up a little bit. You know, when I was doing that uh, work at Keepers Restaurant, I was washing dishes. So I was working Pizza Hut, I was doing Albertson's Floors, and I was still doing Keeper's Restaurant. And there was a a chef, Scott, I can't remember the fellow's last name, but uh, he was a pretty groovy dude, you know. I mean, I looked up to him because he was this, he was a good-looking guy, he was very knowledgeable in food, he had a hot girlfriend, you know, so I wanted to kind of be like him, and that's what what really started it for me. Um, When I left there... I went to another restaurant, and uh, several restaurants there in St. Augustine. One of them was called the uh, the Old City House, and it just started up. And uh, this chef was a uh, uh, a European chef. He was he was an asshole. Can I say that? Yeah. Okay. Um, he was. He was an ass, and it didn't realize that you know way back then that's how chefs are. Okay. So just imagine going with a, a, a fine dining establishment and. You know, me being young, I just couldn't hack it. So I left there and went to another restaurant, Florida Cracker Cafe in St. Augustine. And I think I was there four years uh, at the Florida Cracker Cafe on St. George Street. It was a cool little diner. Um, did lunch and dinner. The owner, Lynn Weeks, he was the mayor of St. Augustine at the time. Uh, had a general contractor's license, so he did a lot of construction work and um, his partner at the time was, uh, I can't remember the fellow's name, owned Barnacle Bill's uh, Seafood Restaurant there in St. Augustine. So got a lot of experience there. Um, about that time, my dad started opening up King Neptunes, which he was um, originally working at. Okay, so he was at Morrison's Cafeteria when I was a young boy. Um, 
parents got divorced, lost track of him. He ended up working over at Bon Secours Fisheries for many years. Um, John Ray Nelson's right-hand man. And uh, so, you know, he retired from, uh, from Bon Secours Fisheries. Uh, they started King Neptunes and, you know, flew from there. So I got a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, restaurant experience at King Neptunes as far as, you know, one, being a son, he worked me to death. Two, uh, you know, I learned a lot about the business itself. I still continued to cook in the kitchen. Um, I went to work for uh, Bayside Grill uh, down in Gulf Shores, and I can't remember, maybe early 2000s or something like that. Worked for worked for them for seven years. Uh, worked my way up to executive sous chef. Learned a lot about cooking there. Um, worked a little with Gerhardt Brill, Chef Brill, down at Perdido Beach Resort. He was a he was a mean German chef, very mean. Uh, but I learned a lot from him. Later on, you know, once he figured out I could cook, <laughs> you know, he started teaching me more. I started being nicer. Um, anyway, um, kind of worked my way through there, and, you know, worked my way with my dad and. Uh, he and I got in an argument one time, and I went to work for Bob Baumhauer for a short stint with Calypso Joe's and, and Mangoes, and left there and went to Ruby Tuesday. I was the general manager of Ruby Tuesday. That's where I met William, William Stitt, Billy, Billy's Bacon. Um, worked for him for a little while, went back to my dad's restaurant, then ended up going to Cracker Barrel for uh, five years. Left Cracker Barrels and opened up the restaurant, which is where we're at today. Awesome. How did you get to Alabama uh, from St. Augustine? Was it your dad that got you that, that <coughs> encouraged you to move here? Or? Well, Dad opened up that restaurant. Um, yeah, it was because I wanted to learn more. I wanted to, you know, at that time in life, I was still trying to find myself, um, and I found my way to Gulf Shores quite a few times. But man, this is a cool city, and I wanted to move. So we moved. I moved. Moved my dog and came over and, you know, went to work. Sounds good. And I hadn't left since, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have roots here in Mobile. You know, my grandparents, excuse me, lived here. My mother was born here, raised here. Um, so, yeah, well, I've got, I've and, got and roots And you mentioned here. Morrison's Cafeteria. So, I mean, there, there's not an older restaurant in Mobile than, than Morrison's Cafeteria. Right. Um and, and I'm very much a meat and potatoes kind of guy, you know. That, that's kind of what I grew up on. My grandmother cooking, um, and, and so that's that's some of your influences too. What, what is that? What, what what was the influences behind Bob's Diner and the and the menu there? Well, um, you know, I mean Morrison's. Okay, so with Dad, he had a cookbook, and this thing must have been I don't know a thousand pages, and it was all Morrison's recipes. And, you know, so I had to break these recipes down, and he made me break these recipes down, and I cooked everything in that book at least 100 times throughout my career. But he would make me break these recipes down in today's standards so that, you know, when you're, those recipes were made for bulk, 80, 100 servings, I had to break it down. So it took me a little while to figure out how to break menus down or recipes down. Once I figured that out, I was like, man, this is breeze. I can do this. This is, you know, the light bulb goes off finally. And it's, you know, hammer down and let's get this done. So when we opened the restaurant, um, you know, I tried seafood and it worked a little bit, not much. But because the building, yeah, you know, when you, that's not what I dreamed about, if, if I can say that. You know, when, when you're a young chef expiring and, you know, Growing up in the industry, you then you're cooking all this food, and you're working at these big, big restaurants, and you're like, okay, man, if I ever get a chance to have my own restaurant, this is what I want. You know, I can tell you that I've dreamed about having my own restaurant, and would on scratch paper, you know, uh, draw a dining room, draw the restaurants out, and figure out what I want, and draw the kitchens out for the best flow, certain things like that. So you know, you're. You're always chasing a dream, you know, if, if you want it. You gotta chase it and you gotta work hard for it because it's not gonna be given to you. I figured that out early. Um, so anyway, when when we 
got this restaurant over here, it was a turnkey operation. So, um, like I said, Bobby didn't know anything about it. And, you know, I've got all this experience. My dad just kind of, you know, says, you know, if this is what you want, you got to work for it. I'm not going to give anything to you. And I said, yeah, I understand that. So um, we, we formed a corporation. Um, Dad wrote me a check for $2,000 as his part of it. Wrote a check for $2,000. Bobby put up all the money to get the lease and the everything going. And I went went to Sam's and I bought all the food, and, you know, to, to get the restaurant open. But prior to that, you know, the leading up to it, you know, it was, I'd have to sit in that restaurant and look at it and say, you know, and, and go outside across the street and sit in a chair and look at the restaurant and say, what, what is this place? You know, talk to me, what do you want? You know, and, and I had to figure that out through trial and error, what that restaurant was telling me to be, if that makes sense to you. Absolutely. So when I, you know, when we opened the doors, the day I opened the doors, we had six bar stools in the restaurant and I had $20 left. There was $20 left. I didn't have a pot to piss in. Man, my bank account at the house was nothing, you know, because I left Cracker Barrel. I didn't get a severance. I quit, you know, I, I quit them. So I didn't get any money. I just had what I had, which was maybe, you know, five, six hundred dollars in the bank account. We're struggling, you know, my wife and kid, we're, we're struggling. And um, so, you know, my wife was like, her, is this what you want to do? And I'm like, maybe I don't have a choice. I've got to pay bills. You know, I'm, I've got to provide for you and my son, you know, or our son. And um, I was like, shit, let's just hammer down. Let's see what happens. And anyway, so th- when we opened, it was 11-8-2014. And I was so engulfed in the restaurant and ma- opening and, you know, this, at the same day as my wife's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so she, she didn't, you know, she was kind of a little upset, but she understood, you know, I mean, Hey, this is what, you know, we're doing, this is what our life entails. So, uh, she understood it. It was, you know, I didn't realize, um, that it was her birthday because I was, you know, focused in other, in other places and other areas. So, uh, yeah, we opened up, you know, um, he wanted to do breakfast because there was only one other, two other breakfast places downtown, Royal, Royal Street Cafe and Spotted Tea which we went to both and they were good, but we can do better. I can do better. You know, that's always been my thing. I can always do better. I can always improve. I can always improve as a person, improve as a chef and improve in business, improve in your community, um, you know, and grow. And um, so anyway, we, you know, we opened up and I worked, um, you know, from open to close for two years straight without a day off. Now, we'll tell you this. We were closed Thanksgiving and Christmas that first year, and the second year, we were, same thing, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So I had four days off in two years, um, only because of the holidays. And, uh, you know, there were nights where I'd sleep down in the, in the back of the Jeep, you know, lay the seats down and put a blanket and a pillow and go to sleep, you know, and, uh, take a bath in the, in the kitchen, you know, with the towel and do things, you know, rough. I had to live rough. And uh, there was nights where it was get cold and I'd have to go inside the restaurant and blow up the air mattress and sleep over in the corner, you know, and uh, listen to everything going on downtown. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, just all hours of nights. It was crazy. It was nuts. But you know what? I did it. And um, I worked hard. And there's a lot of people that, you know, came through those doors that worked there. You know, and you've got to give credit to them because that was the early group of people that helped start that restaurant and and did put in good time you know it was some better than others um a lot of those relationships ended bad sour still are um but that's on them it's not on me i i I figured that out in life um but in order to grow i had to get better as a person um i had to listen to what the customers were telling me i had to develop relationships with those customers um i had to I had to figure it out, man, the hard way, you know, not just, um, you know, for the sake of cooking food is easy. Making good food is easy. Uh, just keep it simple. Um, but the business aspect of things, you know, really took a, a stressful toll on me and made me wiser. Um, you know, my father being in the, the business for as long as he has and learned what he learned, he never really gave me 
too much insight on the business aspect of things. You know, he was a, a hardcore uh, kind of guy that wanted to, uh, you know, let you figure it out on your own, sink or swim kind of deal. <laughs> Um, which made me think, you know, a lot about, you know, if, if I want to do the, you know, if you see something or you think about uh, a direction that you might want to go, think about it, you know, and, and do your pros and cons and, and weigh it out. You know, there are always wants and needs, you know, which one outweighs the other and which one takes priority. You know, when somebody says, ooh, I want that, you know, um, what do you need it? That's all, always a question that I say, you know, ooh, I like that, I want that. And then I'm, I think to myself, well, do I need it? You know, and why would I need that? And what would I do with it? Does that make sense? Yeah. You know? So, so as, as I grew in the, in the business and, and watched that restaurant grow, you know, come about year number two, I, I finally figured out what we need to do. And, you know, I, I did a lot of research with the other restaurants and businesses downtown and, you know, talked to a lot of the locals and kind of got their insight and, and what made them come to our restaurant versus another restaurant or, you know, and it always came down to it's just good food at a great price, you know, and I, and I still believe that today. Um, serve good food at a good price or great food at a good price or good food at a great price. Um, it's, it's not always about the, the money, you know, and I, I learned that too the hard way. You can't always worry about money. Um, worry about what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. Take care of your guests and everything else fall in line. And, um, you know, when, like I said, six bar stools and $20 in the bank account on day one, and when we would make a little bit of money, I'd go out and buy another bar stool. So, you know, we ended up getting, uh, oh, man, there was all kinds of issues with that building. Uh, it was the cooking, you know, the equipment that I had in the back. You know, I had one fryer, so I had to buy another fryer. Um, the grill, the oven was old. I had to work with what I had to work with in order to get there. Um, I put fans in the restaurant. I put air. I remember the first time, man, dude, that first summer was brutal down there. Dude, it was hot. Um, I didn't have any fans. There was a five-ton air conditioning unit in the building, and that five-ton AC unit was old. It was wore out. It wasn't putting it in. So summers, that first summer was hot. Yeah. I mean, I'm telling you, it was hot in that kitchen, dude. It get up to 120, 130 degrees in that kitchen, dude. Yeah. Oh, it was it was terrible. But I'd have a you know ice bucket there with water in it and towels in there. So when I get, you know, always, excuse me, kept uh, towels in that water so that I could you know stay cool in the kitchen. What's the history of that building there? It was it a restaurant before you? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, like I said, it was turnkey operation. So whomever was there prior to me, whether it was one, two, three, four, five, six, eight people, whoever was there, trying to make that business work, and it never really worked. I guess, you know, there could be a lot of reasons why. Um, Lack of knowledge, lack of um, skills, uh, people skills or food skills or business skills, whatever. It doesn't matter what happened in the past where we were, um, you know, going into this, um, was what can we make it, you know, and how can we improve on their mistakes and their faults? And that was a lot, you know, that was all on me. You know, it was make it or break it, sink or swim, you know, going back to that. So um, hard work. Uh, I was determined to succeed. I was uh, dedicated in the way that, you know, very few people are. Um and I, you know, the desire was there. Uh, the, the desire to excel, to the desire to um, to make something, the desire to actually own my own successful business. You know, and um, put your head down and go to work. You well, I'd say you figured it out. I mean, you've been in that location now, eight years now. Eight years. Yeah. And so I mean, that's pretty incredible. Uh, and you mentioned you mentioned something earlier that. Uh, about adapting to and listening to your customers customers needs and that kind of i was thinking about you know how much uh restaurant industry has kind of changed a little bit healthier menu options now uh people expect dietary restrictions to be met at restaurants how have you changed and adapted to that in eight years well you know, you know i i take into consideration that you know not everybody wants bacon and butter you know, but in the South, everything is better with bacon and butter. Um, so there are some, you know, I've, I've had to adapt. 
uh, a little bit to their needs so that, uh, you know, uh, you, you, no grits or breads. You know, I know there's people out there that are on that uh, keto diet. They only eat meats. Um, you know, I want to put healthier options, fish, avocados, uh, tuna, you know, so we, we grew in that aspect of things. As far as, um, you know, that, that would be a, you know, every individual has a choice to make when they walk in that restaurant to eat it or not eat it, you know what I mean? To yeah. order it, to not order it. So, uh, I leave it on them, you know, but I give the options out there. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and speaking of the menu, you know, I, I um, you've noticed, and, and folks, you'll notice too, that when you come in there, there are certain names on that, whether it's uh, Moore's Ham and Eggs or uh, Lee's Breakfast or, uh, you know, Pam's Omelette or, you know, these names are, you know, built in, tied into that restaurant and the growth that we've had down there throughout the years. So I think that by paying homage to those folks and, and showing that I care about them and the, the gratitude, you know, to help us grow, uh, I just put their names on the menu. Who are some of those people? Like, what, what's, some, what's their, some of their stories? Well, uh, let's go with Lee. Okay, so uh, Lee's a uh, local guy that uh, does pools, okay? So he cleans pools. He, he builds pools. He, um, so anyway, he would come in there, and him and his wife lived uh, around the corner. He'd come in there every morning to have a vodka orange juice and, um, that's, uh, Mr. Butch's breakfast really started with Lee, but he only had that a few times. And then he wanted French toast. Um, Denise, there was a girl, Denise, that begged me for French toast for I can't tell you how long. Anyway, I finally did it. Um, so Lee would, you know, he wanted eggs and French toast and bacon. That's Lee's breakfast. Um, Pam, Pam, uh, I forget her last name. Anyway, she'd come in there and on uh, Saturdays or Sundays, and she sat there at the bar one day. She said, I want an omelet. But I want spinach and black olives and feta cheese and bacon. I said, well, I don't have spinach and I don't have feta cheese. And she sat there at that bar, didn't order anything, and she sat and looked at me through that window for two, three hours until I finally got enough of looking at her. Then I went to the doggone store, and I got that product. I came back and I made her an omelet, you know, <laughs> and put it down in front of her. She was happy. And ever since then, that's how, you know, that omelet was born was Pam you know, being brutal to me and, and doing that. Um, uh, Moore's Ham and Eggs, you know, Steve Moore uh, is a local attorney, come in there since day one, man. He's been very um, um, helpful in, in getting people to know about the restaurant. And, um, you know, that's one that, you know, he wanted, you know, he eats all kinds of different stuff. But anyway, um, that was, you know, paying homage to him. Uh, Colonel Anderson's meal, you know, there's a retired army corner diagonal across from the restaurant. His name's on there. Um, that was, you know, I made him cry that day. <laughs> That's cool. But, you know, by showing him that. And that was a very big honor for him. So, you know, um, things like that just means something to me that these people have helped us grow throughout the years and get to where we are. And they still continue to come down there, you know, and, and eat and dine with us. And then, you know, um, you can only, there's only so many names I can put on the, on the menu. Um, uh, you know, so if you see somebody's name on there, it's, it, it definitely has a meaning to it. That's cool. I love that. Yeah. I love that about your meaning too. <laughs> um, I think another thing that's been that's made you successful is is you're a good you're a good owner. I think you're a good boss, and you, and and it shows because a lot of your team has been there for a long time, and um, and so what what do you think about? Uh, I know you take you've taken your team to Bruce Chris after Mardi Gras. Yeah. Um, Talk a little bit about that, about how you take care of your employees. Well, you know, so growing up, I mean, I can't do this without them. You know, as a business owner, you have to realize that your biggest asset is your employees, and you have to treat them accordingly. You know, throughout the years, working with several different chefs and owners of businesses that have been brutal, mean, ugly, um, and rightfully so, because that's the, the era that they grew up in. That's the generation that they knew. Um, that's how they were taught, was to be that way. Um, and I, I didn't like it. You know, a lot of people don't. Um, you know, you can talk down to somebody in a very respectful way. Um, but at the same time, these, you know, I realized that my staff is my biggest asset and I have to take care of them because they're the ones that take care of me, if that makes sense. But it's not always about me and it's not always about them. It's about the guests that come through that door. And we're going to treat them right. We're going to treat them accordingly and be equal and fair amongst everybody. And that's all we ask for our guests, you know, that come through there is they treat us the same as we treat them. 
Um, you know, yeah, they're, we do Ruth Chris after Mardi Gras, but that staff, they bust their butts during Mardi Gras, so they deserve it. Um, and I think that's a good time that we as a group of individuals, a family, um, that you have to build that camaraderie um, with each other and you have to continue to grow and help each other out. You know, um, a lot of times in, in business, uh, people just keep it business. You know, they might see a, 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 a co-worker struggling but never reach out to them. You know, and that's kind of the worst thing you can do, you know. Just be a, a nice human being and, you know, uh, talk to somebody that may be struggling that you might notice, you know, so that we can, um, you know, maybe help them be a better person. And mm -hmm. help yourself along the way, too. So, yeah, you got to treat your staff right. Yeah. Another thing you do during Mardi Gras is the last few years you've, he you've, you've headed up this Operation Feed the Cops. And, and that's the busiest weekend of the year, I know, for your staff and the restaurant. Yeah. But you take your time to 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 help serve our, our police officer men and women who you know are away from their family that weekend as well for a long time and that those few weeks three weeks right um, tell us a little bit about Operation Feed the Cops and how you got started with that and, and 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 what you have going on with that okay so Operation Feed the Cops started uh, I don't know seven years ago I think yeah. So um, when we first opened, there was, a, you know, the Mount of Patrol police officers that come down on the horses. And, uh, man, I just thought that was the coolest thing. I've never seen that before, you know, because I, I was kind of a sheltered kid down on the, on the beach, you know, working sun up, sun down at the beach. You never, you know, I didn't see that. So I never really got to Mobile. In St. Augustine, we didn't have that kind of stuff. We had horses, but not, you know, police officers on horses. Um, so anyway, when I got to Mobile and we opened a restaurant, I just thought that was the coolest thing. So I reached out to those police officers. And uh, kind of became friends with them. They'd come into the restaurant and eat, and I got to know them on a personal level. And then uh, Mardi Gras, you know, they, when they had the precinct down here behind the restaurant, their lieutenant, which is now, um, he's a captain or maybe higher. And, and any, it, regardless of that, anyway, so he would cook for them back there. Well, um, I remember one year they, they didn't have the money to feed all the horses that were down there uh, and all the people. So, you know, I'd walk over there uh, during one of our lulls that we had and get started chit-chatting with us. Man, I've got some, you know, I've got some pork butts in the freezer. Let me go. And I thought those pork butts out, and I went ahead and cooked them up because they didn't have enough food. So that's really where it started at. I gave them the food. You know, I didn't want anything in return. I just wanted to make sure those guys got fed. Um, so, um, you know, and, and I got to talking to the guys and, and girls down there at the, the horse barn and, you know, they're on a limited budget and they really didn't have a lot of, you know, food. You know, the city's not really, I can't say the city's not taking care of them. They do. They make sure they're fed. Um, but they didn't, you know, the kind of horses and those guys and girls just kind of got left to the side to deal with it yourself. Um, and I didn't think too highly of that. So that's where it's, you know, it started at. So the next year, I made sure those guys and girls were, were fed and those horses were fed, too. You know, yeah, they got hay, but they didn't have the apples and they didn't have the carrots and they didn't have, you know, certain things that horses really like, those treats. So um, I made sure we, we took care of them the second year. And then the third year uh, that we did Operation Feed the Cops, I reached out to the city of Mobile Police Department and I said, hey, look, you know, I want to feed on Joe Kane Day and Fat Tuesday, the two busiest days of our year, I want to start feeding all the police officers, you know, and I want to make sure they all get a good home-cooked meal. And that's where it started at. So, you know, when they gave me the go-ahead, I reached out to other restaurant owners down here uh, in Mardi Gras, um, Noel Broughton. I, I reached out to Matt over at the Beer Garden. I went, reached out to Frankie over at Rooster's. Um, the Walker Brothers, uh, Moe's, uh, Ed over at the Blind Mule. So I reached out to those guys and, uh, they donated product, okay? So here's a menu. This is the product that I need to take care of 1,500 people um, throughout the, the course of the Mardi Gras. And they all donated the product. I just cooked it and served it. So, um, you know, th and that's really where it all started from. So, you know, those other businesses down here that contribute to Operation Feed the Cops, man, without them, I, I couldn't get it done. You know, um, the hospital, um, Spring Hill donated last year um chicken or pork butts i don't want to say it was pork butts uh the pulled pork for that which you know that was probably seven eight eight hundred dollars worth of product that they donated 
you know, to the to the cause, which is great, you know. And then, in order to put it all together, I reached out to Mobile Bay Harley Davidson and the in the Hall Group, you know, Harley Owner Group, and they came down and Mobile Bay Harley and a bunch of bikers came down and help us, you know, uh, plate all the food up. It was, it's really neat to see it all done because we have this cooked product and everybody has one job to do. You know, and it's just a big assembly line going two ways, and we can pump out some food. So, you know, that first year that we did that, um, Bart James Barber, which was the police chief at the time, um, stuck his head in there and was and was amazed. You know, at how much food we were pumping out in that short of time. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, and it's just gratitude. You know, I, I I don't want anything back. I just want to make sure that those police officers were fed because they're. They, uh, ooh, man, they work some hours. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you doing that. Yeah. That's, that's, that's an awesome thing that y'all do for sure. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned you mentioned some of your fellow restaurant owners, and I know you're you're you, you're a big supporter of a lot of the restaurants downtown that some probably would say are your competitors. You know, and we we kind of talked about this on the phone the other day that uh-huh. you know some of the new restaurants that pop up, and you're always supporting them too. But uh, well, what benefit do you see in supporting? You know, a lot of people probably think that you know. Uh, some restaurant owners and, you know, some business owners, not just restaurant owners, business owners think that, you know, this is my share and, you know, I don't want to share it with anybody else, but, you know, you kind of have the mentality that hey, we're all better together if we all grow. You know? You're, you're so, exactly right. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's called greed. You know, yeah. the ones that are doing that are they're greedy. And there's no reason to be greedy. They're, what they're, I don't think what they see is the big picture. You know, they're, they're seeing that the, you know, there's, there's, a, they got a piece of the pie and it's a big piece, but if, if you know somebody comes in, that piece of pie gets smaller. Well, that's not always the, the the point here. The point, I guess, is that the more businesses that we have, you know, the more food, the more restaurants that we have, the more people that are going to come down and eat, the more people that are going to go, ooh, I want to try this or I want to try that. So they're always downtown. You know, they're they're coming, they're supporting local businesses downtown. They're supporting downtown. You know, which is the key. That is the key to have a vibrant city is your downtown and that's i think that's where we've gotten to so to see a new business open up and reach out and support them i want to watch them grow i mean hey i was i was new look i started from zero and and where we're at and i and i got you know mad over at the beer garden and and out over at the blind mule when i first opened up hey here's my here's my phone number if you need anything we're here to help you dude and that's what made me realize that you know, without them helping me, I would probably wouldn't have made it as far as we've made it. You know, so I've got to reach back out to these other business owners that are starting up down here and help them. I want to see them succeed. You know, if they put out a good product, why not? You know, it's it, to me it's a no brainer, and I just I wish you know some people would realize that. You know, it's it's not always about you, and it's it's definitely not always about the bottom dollar. You know, it's about feeding the guests and giving them a great food at a good price. Yeah, or good food at a great price. What's some restaurants that you? What's some new restaurants that you've been to lately that you, uh, you've been liking? Uh, let's see. I did the Hammered Cow, uh, which Adam Adam did an awesome burger. He won Burger Week uh, burger too, which that was good. I went and had it. <laughs> um, let's see here uh, the the uh, the Asian the, uh, the the noodle place over here. I can't remember the Slurp Society. Yeah, and that's pretty. Place. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I'd like to see them. I mean, they put out a good product, man. Yeah, uh, funny little location, but it's okay. Um, they put out a good product. Uh, Debris is good. Uh, Grace is opening up. Um, the inside, outside, out there. Uh, the insider, I, I guess that's what it's yep. called. Yeah, um, that's a good little place. I mean, they they put good product. Go go, go visit these places, man. Eat their food. Um, Pam, you want to see them grow? Yeah. Um, you know so. Uh, I just really think it's important that, um, you know, other business owners reach out and support other businesses. Yeah. One of the things I've admired about you is um, you're always giving back to the community. And uh, and I think we, t- we talked a lot about this on, the, on today's, on this podcast, but um, I saw the other day that you were looking for a picture of one of your customers who, who always talks about the restaurant. His dad... Um, his dad owned a restaurant that his dad owned and you wanted to find that picture and frame it for him. Yes. Did you, did you, were you successful in that? I was. Um, okay. So Jimmy, uh, Mr. Jimmy, he's a great fella. Um, and he comes in and he eats. Uh, he's, he's really, he calls up. He doesn't have a lot of time for lunch. Hey, this is Jimmy. I want this, this, and this. And 
So uh, and I'll be there in 10 minutes. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, he walks through the door. And we usually have his food waiting on him. Uh, definitely, a, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll set him up his drink, whatever he wants to drink, set him up so he can come in, eat, and leave. So uh, <clears throat> Jimmy told me that, you know, when he was a kid, his daddy had a, a public cafe in the 50s and 60s down here at number one Government Street. Uh, which is right down the road from where we're at. So um, I did some research. I reached out to the city. The city didn't have any pictures. I had to en- ended up going to the University of South Alabama to get uh, some archive pictures. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're really easy to work with out there. Um, and it took a little bit. We found it. So, I, you know, I made the post on Facebook, and Jimmy comes in one day, and he says, Hey, he says, uh, why are you looking for this? I said, Well, Jimmy, I wanted to give you a picture uh, you know, of your dad's restaurant and maybe find some other pictures of inside the restaurant, maybe find a picture of you working when you was a kid and uh, frame it and give it to you. He says, well, Tony, I've already got that. <laughs> and I said, well, Jimmy, that's not the point. The point is I'm going to give you another one. <laughs> and I don't care if it's the same picture or not, you're still going to get one. <laughs> um, but that was just, you know, it's something that I thought that would be uh, – you know, giving back to one individual that uh, has made an impact on me somehow, some way. Yeah. You know? It's just those genuine things that you do like that that, that I think make, help make you successful. And, well. And, um, it shows also in your reviews. You know, you got some of the best Google reviews of any restaurant in Mobile, in downtown Mobile. And uh, it's, a, it's a true mom and pop restaurant. You know what I mean? So you're going to go in there and you're going to sit beside somebody and you're going to probably get to know the person next to you. Right. Uh, if you don't know the person next to you, Tony's probably going to introduce you. Yeah. Y'all are going to introduce you to each other. I've you've done, done that, that to, to me several times. <laughs> I've met several people in there before. That's good. Uh, because you've introduced them to me. And, hey, it's Chris with, you know, the Bimble Bites Tour, yeah. you know. And so I just, I appreciate that, too. And I think that's what makes one of your, your restaurants special. Well, I mean, do you remember when you started this, you know, food tour thing and you wanted to grow it and, and look at you, you know, where you're at, you know. And I, it's great to see that. That's, to me, makes me feel good. It's it's not about, um, once again, it's not about money, man. It's about these relationships that we build. You and I have built a relationship, and I've built a relationship with Mr. Jimmy and a, a, a lot of other people, and it's they're great relationships, you know. So I think if, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yep. You know, but you just got to go about it the right way, I guess. I yep. Don't, I don't know. There's not a book written on it, so <laughs> I guess I'm writing my own book. I like it. <laughs> All right, we're going to transition to the next segment of our show, and it's okay. called Meet and Three, which is appropriate for this this podcast episode. Okay. Meet and Three. So we've gotten into the meat of the podcast. Now I'm going to ask you three kind of rapid-fire questions. And uh, the first one is, what do you think you'd be doing if you were not working in the restaurant industry? Oh, man. That's a great question. I don't know. Um, uh, you know, as a kid, I dreamed about being a police officer. As a kid, I dreamed about being a train engineer choo choo you know so either one of those two okay if i wouldn't have started in the restaurant it'd been either one of those two yeah second question is what is a controversial food take that you have what is a controversial yeah, something that you, it would get you laughed all i'd ask this to panini pete and he I'd ask him like what would what would what would get you laughed off the food network if you something that you enjoy Man, that's a good. <laughs> and, and mine to him, when well, I say it again, you know, is I like I like hot sweet tea. I don't I don't like iced iced sweet tea. I don't like the ice that waters it down. I like the flavor of the tea. Hot sweet tea is my kind of my controversial food take. You know, I don't I don't know, man. You don't uh, have one. I, I don't have one. No, so I can't answer that. <laughs> All right. What is one dish everyone should get Bob's right now? Tony special. What's that? So uh, that's a uh, uh, smoked gouda cheese grits with uh, fried fish and crawfish etouffee. That's good stuff. Yeah, it's, all right. it's it's good, man. All right, little, coming little hot lunch. sauce on there. And, uh, yeah, that's really good. <laughs> um, that's only because it's after me, Tony Special. Um, I, there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, the omelets are great. Uh, Lee's breakfast is really good. Um, you know, I've got pancakes, alligator sausage, and eggs. That's a good combination. Uh, there's just all kinds of, but yeah, one thing I'd, I'd say Tony's special. Okay. Last segment of our show is called Chris's Dishes, and this is where I talk about the best dish that I've had this week, and then I'm going to turn it over to you, and you talk about the best dish maybe you've had this week, too. I'm going to do something a little bit different on this one. Um, we're coming out of Thanksgiving, so I didn't even go out to eat this weekend. You know, I was out of town, and we all were full from turkey and, you know, sweet potato casserole and stuff like that. 
my dish for this week is actually going to be my favorite dish at Bob's, and that is the raised breakfast sandwich. And uh, I get the three meat, you know, so I go with the uh, the sausage and the bacon and the ham. And, and the ham. Yep, I go with the three meat, and that's that is my favorite. I, and I'm I've, I've I've said it before. I'm not a huge breakfast person. But that is that's a phenomenal breakfast. That's a good sandwich when you can get right that here. the raised breakfast yeah. sandwich. So that's what I that's that is Chris's dishes for this week. So what's the best dish you've had this week? Uh, um, let's see. Yeah. So uh, I had a, a petite fillet with uh, blue cheese and a bernays sauce and uh, grilled asparagus and uh, roasted garlic mashed potatoes. You cooked it yourself? No, I had somebody cook it for me. Where were you? Took my wife out to dinner. Oh, where'd y'all go? Yeah, we went to uh, Zeke's. Okay. Zeke's Marina. They yeah. just opened up down there. So, yeah, we went down there and had a had a good dinner with some friends. So, yeah, yeah that, that was probably the best meal I've had. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, Tony, I thank you for coming on the show today, man. I've really enjoyed it. Y'all got to go check out Tony. Y'all got to go down to the corner of Fat and Happy, which is also known as North Jackson and St. Francis. Francis Street. Correct. So, y'all go check out Tony. Thank, thank you. y'all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, man. Absolutely. I've enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Port City Plate Podcast presented by Bienville Bites Food Tour. You can book a food tour online at bienvillebitesfoodtour.com. And again, like I said, go see, go see, uh, go see Tony down there at Bob's. Um, and, and check out our Facebook group. It's the Port City Plate. And, uh, and we'll be doing these episodes. We'll be uh, releasing episodes every other Tuesday. And so y'all go check out some of the other episodes we've had. We've had some good ones, and and Tony is going to fit right in with all the rest of them. So, Tony, thanks again. Thank you. All right.